Okay. Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining this edition of VMAX. We're really excited to have uh, David Lopez Lidl here to give the first talk for 10 minutes, and then we're going to have Pascal Noel uh, give the 40 minute talk uh, with his co author Peter Ganong here. Just a quick reminder everyone's audio and video is going to be muted, uh, and you can use the QA function uh, to ask questions, and then there'll be the live QA chat at the end. Uh, and I'll put in the link for the informal discussion at the end of the one hour. Uh, and so please don't use the chat function unless there's some technical difficulties that you need to reach us. Okay, so without further ado, sorry for the delay. Uh, David, you have 10 minutes, so I will start the timer now. Uh, everybody can see the presentation. All right. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting us to uh, present this paper, which is joint work with uh, my colleagues, uh, Craig Chikis and Jonathan Goldberg. Uh, both are in this uh, seminar. So our motivation is really a set of uh, what we think is a really important trends that occur in the recent decades. Productivity growth has been low, market power has been rising, and um, business dynamism has fallen. And there are many potential explanations that have been proposed to explain these facts. Uh, what is interesting to us is that includes the long and persistent decline in interest rates. However, the effects of interest rate on productivity growth and market power remain far from well understood. So our paper tried to evaluate whether low interest rates are an explanation for these trends. So the question to motivate uh, the paper um, is uh, what you see in the top of this uh, uh, slide, do low interest rate harm innovation, competition, and productivity growth? And the answer depends on the nature of creative distraction playing a role in the economy. So in, in, in superior models, if market laggers and entrants can innovate only by incrementally refining their existing technologies, then the answer to this question is yes. Uh, a recent contribution, very important one, by Lian, uh, Liu Mian and Sufi show that with a purely incremental innovation, as the interest rate falls to very low levels, growth declines with low R&D leaders becoming entrenched. However, much of the literature assumes that market laggards or entrants have some chance to innovate radically and immediately catch up to the leading technology in their industries. And we show quantitatively that in these canonical models, low interest rates boots productivity growth. So what we do is to use micro data to estimate a superior model that nets these two alternatives, among others, and this is flexible one. Um, here's our main result. Laggards have a meaningful chance to innovate radically, which implies that low interest rate increases growth and market competition. We incorporate entry socially optimal patent policy design and financial frictions into the model and all these features reinforces our results. Basically, we see our results as a preliminary evidence that cast doubt on low interest rates as a main or as an explanation of low productivity growth amid rising markups. I'm gonna move quickly to the key ingredients of our model. Our model features a continuum of intermediate goods industries. In each industry, two firms compete in the product market and they invest in R&D to improve productivity. The firms are arranged around the quality ladder. Every rung represents a productivity improvements of a factor lambda. And each industry state variable is the number of ranks between the leader and the lagger. And we denote that variable by S. Competition within the industry is in prices over trend. So the equilibrium is such that the winner takes it all and leader profits, as you can see, are increasing in this S value. The next slide explains a little bit how do we model in a very simple way moving along the quality ladder. And that's kind of a feature of most of the Schumpeter and Aguilhauer model. So the firms innovate at the rate X, and to do that, they need to hire R&D workers. And the cost of hiring is this function that you see there on top of the slides. 
X is a scale by a, by a parameter B, and the convexity of the costs are governed by this parameter lambda. Every time the leader innovates, advance one step in the rank, in the ladder. And upon innovation, laggers can close the gap completely with probability phi, or one run at a time with probability one minus phi. And we call these quit of a slow catch up, respectively. At each point in time, there is a point song exogenous probability that the pattern expires, and we call that eta. And pattern expiration implies that the gaps can be closed completely with probability zeta or one run at a time with probability one minus zeta. So we call that symmetrically quick and slow catch up in pattern policy. So the next slide describes how is the relationship between growth on interest rate as a first pass in this kind of model. I'm going to explain that the nature of credit destruction is gonna be crucial for understanding this relationship. Our model nests, as I mentioned, canonical models in the literature. The first one that we consider in these slides by Asimoglu and Axigy 2012, which features quick catch up innovation, phi equal to one, as you can see at the bottom of the slide. The left panel shows growth G as a function of the household discount rate Row. And for this model of quick catch up, as you can see, growth rises as the discount rate falls. So we also nest the ambient Sufi model, which features, as you can see, is low catch up through innovation phi equal to zero, and is low catch up through pattern expiry zeta equal to zero. In the right panel, you see that the thick black line corresponds to this model. Starting from low interest rate, further declines in the interest rate lead to lower growth. However, if we allow for a moderate chance of quick catch up, say 25% instead of none, this inverted U relationship completely disappears, as you can see from the red dashed line that I just put in the figure. So this is the key motivation of our paper. And with this, we estimate the model using micro data. That's what I discuss in the next slide. Using simulated method moments, we estimate the parameters of the model to catch, to match, 14 moments related to productivity growth, markups, profit volatility, R&D to sales, and any different elements of the reallocation of the economy. As you can see of the column of moment use in the estimation in this table. I don't have time to go much into the detail, but you can see on the left side that the, the three parameter phi, land, and B that we estimate, and what, what we estimate are such that the five parameter implies that upon innovation, laggard has a 28% chance of closing the technological gap with the leader. And you can see from the column of model and data that the quality of the feed is quite good without imposing too much degree of freedom in terms of parameter estimates. So the bottom parameters that you see are externally calibrated and we have plenty of robust and I would cut later to discuss these results. The next slides, moving to markup and innovation output distribution in the model. As you can see in these two graphs, we match really well the full distribution of markups, left panel, and the innovation output, right panel. The bottom table gives you a sense of identification in our model. Imagine that we move to the column on the right of this table, and we introduce severe restriction in the creative destruction of the economy. We do that by setting the parameter phi instead of 28% to a value of 5%, substantially lower. And then what you can see there is counterfactually, they will lead to an 83% of industry with markups above 40% instead of what we estimate, which is in line with Hall. The next slide discuss the firm's innovation implied by the model. This slide shows innovation rates for the leader and the lagger as a function of the industry technological gap on the horizontal S, variable S. The blue line corresponds to a row discount factor of 2% and the red line is a discount factor of only 25 basis points. The first thing to notice is that the tight firms are the most innovative one, those that have a value of S equal to zero. That reflect the need for them to escape competition. As firms move ahead as leaders or fall behind like laggards, their innovation rates dramatically fall. However, which is important is that the laggards never give up or become completely discouraged in our estimated model. 
their innovation rates always stay well above zero because an innovating logger, no matter how far behind, always has a chance to a quick catch up if it innovates. Accordingly, you, you see have, as you well- have one, minute lower left, David. one minute left. Yeah, thank you. Lower discount rate, increase innovation rates for all firms technology composition. The next slide gives you a sense of the key result. The blue line in the left panel captures the firm side of the problem. For a given interest rate, what is the growth rate consistent with profit maximization? The dashed gray lines are the other equation for different values of row. For a given value of row, the equilibrium is the intersection of these two schedules. As the discount rate falls, the interest rate falls and growth increases. The right panel shows that the average markup falls as the interest rate declines. That is, lower interest rate triggered a pro-competitive shift in the gap distribution. Accordingly, in Schumpeteria model that fits the data well at the individual micro industry level, the aggregate implication of a lower interest rate sharply is at odds with the important micro aggregate trends of low productivity growth and rising markup power. Our result casts doubt on how low interest rate can be a source of explanation of these trends. In the last minute, this slide described that we have in the paper, substantial robustness exercise, exercise that run from adding entry to the model and re-estimate too much reallocation, employment shared on, by firm age, adding financial frictions, uh, changing the value of targeting moments, and re-estimate. All the time, we find that the parameter phi that captures this advantage of backwardness is well above zero. Growth is always rising as you move uh, road to lower values. Interestingly, our results are also very robust to changes in patent policy and adjusting optimal, optimally patent policy, we get rid of this inverted U uh, element of the uh, Lia Mian Sufi paper. So overall, the result tend to cut some downs on low interest rate as an explanation of low productivity and rising market power. Thank you so much, Kurt, and thank you everyone. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, David. Uh, very well done to pack that all in in 10 minutes. Uh, and you know we're happy to have uh, more discussion in the informal session afterwards uh, for people to do that. And thanks for the questions that were in the Q&A. So without further ado, uh, Pascal, you have 40 minutes. So take it away. Great. Well, thank you uh, so much for, uh, for having us on the program. Uh, this is joint work with Peter Ganong and Joe Vavra, who are also from the University of Chicago, as well as Fiona Gregg, Max Liebeskind, and Daniel Sullivan from the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute. Peter and Joe are online panelists and are uh, willing and, and able to answer your questions. So please, please ask away. Uh, it will be very helpful for us as we are working on this project. So there was a massive disruption in the labor market due to the COVID shock. And governments actually across the world responded to this disruption with the relatively novel policy tool, which was countercyclical benefit levels of unemployment insurance. Indeed, in the, in the US, we saw the largest increase of unemployment insurance benefits in history. So households or unemployed workers were eligible for supplements of $600 per week between April and July. And then uh, it went down for three, to $300 for about six weeks. The, at these levels, the replacement rates for households was up to 145%. So benefits were replacing more than households were losing in their in income. So in this project, we ask two questions. First, we ask how much did these dramatically expanded benefits increase consumer spending? And what would we have expected based on pre-pandemic evidence? And second, how much did these expanded benefits discourage job finding? And again, what would we have expected based on pre-pandemic evidence? To help answer these questions, we measure spending and job growth and job finding using anonymized bank account data. We think there's at least four reasons to be interested in trying to understand the impacts of these increased benefits on spending and job finding. First is that these expansions and benefits were large enough to matter for aggregate spending and employment during this time period. Between April and July, 
about $260 billion was transferred to households in the form of these $600 supplements. Second is that these targeted transfers have important distributional consequences. Unlike sort of the time-tested policy of universal payments that come from tax refunds, these types of payments are, uh, are focused on a, a specific subset of the population who is potentially in a, in, a, in a challenging financial state. So during the pandemic, about a quarter of working age households received unemployment insurance benefits. Third is that the canonical approach to optimal unemployment insurance trades off the consumption smoothing benefits of increased spending with the costs, the moral hazard costs of decreased job finding. So by measuring each of these impacts directly, we can help inform the normative evaluation of this policy. Third is that the large size the surprise expiration at the end of July and then the partial reinstatement in September provides a unique sequence of policy changes that can help us test implications of structural models that haven't been testable before. Okay, what do we find? So we find that the spending response to expanded benefits is substantial and in some cases is larger than you would have expected. What we find is that when this $600 supplement is in place, the spending of unemployed households is actually higher than that of employed households. It's substantially, show, substantially so. Using a variety of research designs, we estimate a marginal propensity to consume of between 29 and 43 cents, depending on the design. And importantly, and perhaps surprisingly, we find that these MPCs are high even for households with high liquidity that they've accumulated through prior receipt of these UI benefits. This stands in contrast to standard consumption models where high MPCs are driven by households with low liquidity. In contrast to the large response on the spending side, we find a muted response on the job search side. We find that job finding is largely stable from May to October, despite very dramatic changes in replacement rates during this time period. When we you look at the data and combine it with the model, we find an elasticity of unemployment durations with respect to benefits of 0.02, which is orders of magnitude below standard estimates of the disincentive effect. When we combine our spending and our job search findings with a back of the envelope calculation, we conclude that actually the expanded UI likely increased total employment on net. Finally, I want to emphasize that this is work in progress. Um, we're still working on you know, unpacking the mechanisms and the broader lessons. And so we're very grateful for taking any advice and suggestions at this point as we're actively still working on this project. So what I'm going to do with the rest of the time, I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking about the institutions and the data that we use. Then I'm going to focus on measuring the impact on spending and then using a model to interpret that evidence. And then I'll do the same thing looking at the data on job finding and again using a model to interpret what we find. So just to talk about what the policy environment was, in the CARES Act it included a dramatic expansion. So every unemployed household um, who was receiving benefits was eligible for an extra $600 per week supplement between April and July. The supplement expired at the end of July but the president uh, announced a $300 supplement that was eligible, that was available for six weeks after that period. This was paid out in arrears, largely in either September and October, and there was large cross-state variation in when this $300 supplement was actually paid out to workers, which we're going to exploit in our empirical design. And then finally, there's been a new $300 per week supplement. It's been available between January and August uh, of this year, but we don't have data from 2021 yet, but we're excited to analyze it when we do get it. So talk about the data we use. We use um, a data set that is derived from the universe of bank account records from the JP Morgan Chase. We look at income, including labor income, tax refunds, and unemployment benefits that are direct deposited into household bank accounts. For spending, we use primarily two measures. 
So one narrower measure of spending is just uh, card, credit card and debit card spending, as well as cash withdrawals from the bank account. And a second broader measure includes card and cash, as well as paper checks and electronic payments that we can identify from the bank account that are for things on spending, things like utility bills, for example. So some key advantages of the data are that we have in one place, we can link information on income, on spending and on job finding for the same households. And second, we have a large sample size with wide geographic coverage that also spans most of the income spectrum. Who's in our sample? So our primary analysis sample is gonna include 844,000 households in 31 states who received a direct deposit of unemployment insurance and who meet minimum transaction and labor income screens so that we can be confident that we're capturing most of their uh, financial life. We also look at a random sample of 187,000 employed households that we primarily use as a control group. We have developed a methodology to define UI spells, job separations, and recalls based on when payments from either uh, unemployment insurance agencies or employers start and stop showing up in household bank accounts. When we match or when we compare what we see in our data relative to benchmarks uh, uh, in terms of the number of UI claims, in terms of the level of UI benefits that the states reported to the Department of Labor, we are, um, are similar to those benchmarks. Okay, so let me start now by using this data set to analyze how did these expansions of unemployment insurance benefits affect household spending. So I'm gonna start with a descriptive analysis of just showing the time series of spending comparing households who were unemployed in April to a comparison group of households who are continuously employed over this time period. So what we can see is that up to January, 2020, both income and spending are tracking very, very similarly for both of these groups. Indeed, we've, we've matched the um, control group of employed households on a similar level of labor income pre-job loss to the households who ended up losing their jobs. So very similar paths of income and spending. However, once the households started losing their jobs in April of 2020, what we find on the income side is very dramatically different than what you usually see for households losing jobs, which is that the households who are unemployed actually see a dramatic increase in their income relative to the employed households. This is because of the $600 per week transfer that was a very generous transfer and meant that you know, a large share of households actually were receiving more on unemployment insurance than they were when they were employed. At the same time, when you look at spending, you also see the spending of the unemployed households is rising right when these transfers um, start hitting their bank accounts. Indeed, again, in stark contrast to normal times when, when you, the unemployed households lose jobs, they cut their spending relative to employed households, we actually saw that unemployed households increased their spending by about 20%, both relative to employed households and even relative to their own pre-job loss levels. At the end of July, the $600 supplement expired and so income fell. Then it went back up when the $300 supplement was paid out in September and then went back down again in October once that supplement expired. And again, you find that spending fell, rose again when you had the $300 supplement and then fell again after that secondary supplement expired. So this provides sort of descriptive evidence that spending is highly responsive to these transfers. We can't make any causal claims from just this evidence alone because there could be other things that are going on in the background that are affecting uh, relative spending. And so we're gonna now turn to three research designs that we argue give us a causal estimate of the impact of unemployment insurance benefits on spending during this time period. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use uh, three different research designs. So first is we select workers who separate at the end of March, but vary in their timing of benefit receipt. So here what I'm, pl what I'm plotting is the time series of UI benefits for these groups. What we see is that uh, we're looking at 
households who we observe separating from their jobs at the same time, but there was widespread delays and well-reported delays in how long it took for people to actually receive their unemployment insurance benefits. And so even people who separated from their jobs at the same time, different people um, actually received their benefits at different times. So we're gonna use this variation um, in our empirical strategy. This plot on the right is showing the spending for the same groups that are receiving their unemployment insurance benefits at different times. I want you to notice two things from this plot on the right. The first is that the pattern of spending before UI benefits hit their bank account is very similar for each of these groups. That supports our identification assumption that the path of spending for the households who are waiting for benefits is a good counterfactual for the path of spending that would have occurred for the households who actually did end up getting their benefits. The second thing I want you to notice is that spending spikes up exactly in the time periods in which the UI benefits hit household bank accounts. And so from this, we can conclude that these UI benefits had a large impact on consumer spending. So second, we're gonna look at what was the impact uh, on households when these $600 weekly supplements expired at the end of July. So these expirations happened at basically the same time for all of the households. And so we don't have a unemployed comparison group. So instead we compare to employed households. So here on the left, I'm plotting the uh, change in unemployment insurance benefit relative to the first week in July. And once these benefits expire, you, saw, you see a sharp decrease in benefits for the unemployed group. On the right, I'm showing the spending of these unemployed households and the spending of these employed households, again, relative to their um, July level. And again, exactly when these supplements expire at the end of July, you see a sharp relative drop in the spending of the unemployed households relative to the employed households. So from this, we conclude that when these benefits turn off, you also see a large impact on spending. Finally, in our third research design, we estimate the impact of that $300 supplement that was largely paid out in arrears by some states in September or some states in October. And so we're gonna, we group households depending on whether they were in a September state or in an October state. The September state received their benefits earlier than the households who received them in the October states. And so we use the October states as a control for the spending of the households in the states that received benefits in September, this, six, this $300 supplement in September. And what we see is again, spending is trending similarly for both of these groups beforehand. It's dropping, not surprisingly, because these are households for whom that $600 supplement had just expired. But when that new $300 supplement hits their bank accounts, you see a large relative increase in spending. So again, we see a sharp, effect of the unemployment insurance benefits on spending at in the September, October time period. So we put each of these three research designs in a regression framework, and we use that to calculate the marginal propensity to consume. And we estimate a relatively large MPCs of between 29 cents and about 40 cents, depending on, depending on these strategies. What we're gonna do now is compare the spending responses that we measure empirically to what you would have predicted uh, to, from models that are based on pre-pandemic evidence. Okay, so what do we do? How do what does this model look like? It's a very intentionally standard model, a monthly consumption savings problem where households have an AR wage and unemployment shocks. The only sort of pandemic element in the model is the policy variation in unemployment insurance benefits. And we put in the model the same type of variation that we observe in the data. So we increase unemployment insurance benefits by $600 per week starting in April. And we consider two different expectations that households might have about how long those benefits might last. So we, in one version, we have the households expecting that these unemployment benefits are gonna expire as they actually do in practice. And in another version, we treat the households as being surprised when these benefits actually expire at the end of July. Then we add in this unanticipated $300 benefit that comes in in September. 
and we choose essentially the discount rate um, and the to match the pre-pandemic evidence on the consumption response to uh, tax rebates of 0 0.25. To give you a sense of how the model works in practice, uh, I'm just here, I think maybe the easiest way is to see the income paths in the model relative to the data. And you can see this for two groups. The first is the group in blue, who we assume loses their job in April and is receiving this $600 benefit. And you can see the, the solid line is the model and the dotted line is the data. So these households that receive this $600 benefit have large increases in their income upon job loss. Again, very different than normal times, but that's what we see in the pandemic. And then in August, when the $600 supplement expires, their income falls. It jumps back up in September when that temporary $300 benefit is paid and then falls back down in October. In red, you see the time path for the um, comparison group who also loses their job in April, but doesn't actually get their benefits. It takes them more time. They have to wait for benefits for a while. They don't get their benefits until June, at which point they receive benefits with a bunch of back pay to fill in the weeks that they lost, just like we see in the data. And then after that, they have the same level as the households who were receiving benefits all along. And so we're exactly, we now have in the model the same policy experiments that we estimated in the data. We can compare the spending response of the households that are waiting for UI relative to those who actually get UI at the start. We can look at the impact of losing the UI benefits at the end of July, and we can look at the impact of that $300 supplement that hits the bank accounts in September. So we do those same experiments in the model as we did in the data, and we can do it under both of those information assumptions. So first here in uh, purple, I'm showing you what the model implies for the NPCs under the assumption that that expiration at the end of July was expected. And what you see is that the pre-pandemic models can largely match a strong spending response to UI benefits at the onset of unemployment. It's not surprising. These are households who have lost their job. They're low liquidity. You transfer them money. They're going to spend a lot of it. But it doesn't, it can't explain why households cut their spending if they expect this benefit to, to run out at the end of July. On the other hand, in green is what we would expect if the households were surprised by the expiration of the unemployment insurance benefits at the end of July. And here, the model is also able to generate somewhat large spending responses, like we see in the data. But the one that we, you know, that none of the versions of the model are able to match is the fact that we see a very large spending response to the $300 supplement in September, whereas the data predicts, sorry, whereas the model predicts that we should see a very muted response to these to this temporary transfer. And the reason is because. At this point, households have been receiving unemployment insurance for four months. This substantial $600 a week or $2,400 per month transfer has increased the liquidity. And indeed, we find that household liquidity is much higher in September than it was at the beginning of the pandemic. And in the model, when households have very high liquidity, you would expect very low spending responses. And that is not what we see in the data. One way to understand this um, difference between model and data is to think about it from the perspective of how the marginal propensity to consume, which I'm plotting here on the y-axis, changes with assets. Because the consumption function is concave with respect to assets, you find a declining MPC with respect to assets. This is a standard prediction of any benchmark consumption model. Then you can, you can see that if you just look at households who are waiting for UI benefits in the model, they're very, very low liquidity. They have very high MPCs. This is exactly what you'd expect from the standard model. However, um, once you give them one month of regular UI, the MPC starts declining in the model. They have higher liquidity, so therefore you're, you'd expect a smaller, more muted response. And over here in light blue, once you've given them four months of this $600 weekly supplement, they've accumulated a substantial amount of liquidity. 
So their assets relative to income are actually high and you'd expect a very small response. And again, in black is the NPC that we actually measure for households in, uh, in September, which is much higher than it's predicted by the model. So to summarize, the model can generate large responses at onset, just like the data. Um, you can also generate large responses at expiration if you model the expiration as a surprise to households, but it is very, very difficult. And in fact, in the standard uh, representative agent model, we, we, you can't have the empirical response match what we actually see in the data under the standard calibrations. So what we're working is trying to think about what kinds of models actually can match the data where we're exploring uh, things like permanent heterogeneity or potentially behavioral forces. So now let me look at the impact of UI on uh, job finding. So first in the data. So let's um, think about what was going on in this time period. So there is a, um, uh, a coffee shop in Kentucky where the owner wrote a blog post that went viral and got picked up on NPR. And um, what was written in the blog post was we were forced to close our business. What's really going to kill businesses like ours is the federal pandemic unemployment compensation program. The bill gives an additional $600 per week to unemployed households. So what we're gonna do in this section is try to understand how important this channel was. If indeed this substantial benefit deterred workers from finding jobs as this coffee shop owner was predicting in the blog post. So one way to look at this is just to plot the raw number of UI benefit recipients. And what we see is that the number of UI recipients spiked dramatically at the onset of the pandemic. It started falling a little bit in June, fell a little bit more at the end of July when the supplements expired and then continued trending down. Now, for the most part, the number of UI recipients that were still receiving benefits even after the supplement expired is very similar to the number that were receiving it before, which provides some sort of suggestive evidence that this expiration didn't um, uh, incentivize a massive return to the job market. So now I'm gonna um, plot things in terms of the hazard rate of exiting from unemployment, which is a standard way of depicting things in the unemployment insurance literature. We can see that the hazard of exiting from unemployment insurance declined sharply before the supplement was actually in effect in April. It then rose back up and then declined a little bit uh, at the end of July. It rose temporarily when the benefits expired and then settled at a, at a still relatively low level afterwards. Another way to um, show sort of limited evidence of the UI benefits graphically is to look at heterogeneity across workers. And so here we've cut workers into whether they are uh, replacement rates are above median in dark blue or below median in purple. Now, these types of these groups of workers have dramatically different replacement rates. The replacement rates for the above median group is about 85 percentage points higher than the replacement rates for the below median group in purple. But I want you to notice two things from this figure. The, for, the first is that even though these groups have very different replacement rates, they have very similar UI exit patterns before the expiration. And second is that the differences post expiration are also very similar between the two groups. So this provides additional evidence that the uh, expiration of the $600 supplement didn't seem to have a very large impact on, uh, on job search. Now, why might that be? So we're still working on uncovering the mechanisms, but one thing that's important to note is that the nature of UI exit is very different during the pandemic than in prior times. So what we're plotting here is the share of workers in dark blue who are exiting uh, to recall. They're going back to their prior employer. In normal times, about a quarter of workers who are receiving unemployment insurance go back to their prior employer. What we see during the pandemic is especially during the summer, this, this share skyrocketed up. About three quarters of households who were receiving UI benefits left to go back to their prior employer and as far as we can see in our data through October, it still remains elevated relative to pre-pandemic levels. 
So now I'm going to compare the patterns that we see in the data to what you would have expected in a model. Right? And the reason we're doing this is because um, we want some way to get an estimate, a quantitative estimate of the disincentive impact of these $600 supplements. So usually um, you would want to look for a quasi-experimental design. That's not possible for job search because everybody is eligible for the same benefit supplement at the same time. However, one thing that we have going for us in this setting is that the size of the supplement is so large that you would, ex that it would, be, you would expect it to have very large and visible impacts just on the time series patterns of exit if, in fact, um, you did have the impact that you would have expected based on pre-pandemic evidence. And so we're going to use a structural model calibrated to pre-pandemic evidence to help us understand what the implications are for the quantitative impact of the supplement on job search. So specifically, we're going to ask two questions. We're going to ask, what would the predicted effect of this large $600 benefit be using only data and studies from before the pandemic? And then second, we're going to ask, well, what can we conclude about the disincentive effect after we estimate parameters to match the behavior we actually observe empirically during the pandemic. Again, as for the spending model, the job search model is deliberately simple. We're taking sort of an off the shelf job search model. Uh, we have the same income process and discount factors as we used in the spending model. We feed into the model the same two scenarios about what, what workers could expect about the $600 supplement and its renewal. So we have a expect expiration version where households sort of know that it's going to expire at the end of July and a surprise version where households are surprised when it actually expires at the end of July. The most important parameter um, that governs the um, disincentive effect of the $600 supplement is how costly it is for households to search for a job. So to discipline the, those, that parameter, we uh, calibrate it to match the median disincentive effect from this large pre-pandemic meta-analysis from Shmita and Von Wachter. So we calibrate it to match an elasticity of unemployment duration with respect to benefit levels of 0 0.33. So this plot shows the UI exit hazard in the, in the dashed line that we observe in the data relative to the predictions from the standard benchmark model calibrated to pre-pandemic evidence in these, in these solid lines. So in uh, purple is, this, is, the, is what you get from the standard model if the expiration is a surprise. And in dark blue is what you would get if the expiration is expected at the end of July. Both of these make very sharp predictions. If households were responding to the 600 supplement, as you would have expected based on pre-pandemic studies, you would have seen basically search go to zero when these very generous supplements were in effect. If households were expecting the supplement to expire, then they would have gradually increased search throughout the summer until the expiration occurred at the end of July. If on the other hand, they were surprised by the expiration, you would have seen this low level of exit throughout July and then a sharp jump at the end of July when the benefits actually expire. So neither of these are what we see in the data. We see something very different, which is that search is actually rising early in the period and then falling around the time of expiration. So because the standard sort of pre-pandemic models are unable to fit the data, we enrich the model with three empirically plausible ingredients that capture forces that we think are important during the pandemic. The first is I, I showed you that plot about how recalls surged during the pandemic. And so we add recalls, we add exogenous recalls following the model of CATS 1986. Second is we calibrate the job search cost, not to match pre-pandemic evidence, but to match what we actually observe about UI exit for non-recalled employees during the pandemic. This part is crucial. The fact that the exit rate is so low for non-recalled employees and is 
very stable even after the supplement expired means that we estimate that it was very difficult to search for a cost during the pandemic. Okay, why might this be? It's con consistent with either sort of labor market congestion impacts as suggested by um, a recent paper by Marinescu, Scandalis, and Zhao, or just health risks. Households are very worried about searching for work. It's very difficult to search for work at a time when you're having a public health crisis. Third, in order to match the temporary spike, the, the short, sort of sharp but temporary spike that we see once benefits expire, we add in a type that has a low uh, cost of search that allows them to quickly find a job when the benefits expire, which is similar to an approach taken in a recent paper by Stefano Delavigna and co-authors. So in this enriched model, we find patterns in the, in the model that are very, very similar to the patterns that we actually observe in the data. And each of the elements are important in matching what we actually observe in the data. So the rise in the uh, May and June period is driven by recalls, firms recalling their employees back to them. The temporary spike at exhaustion is driven by this, like about 1% of households who have a low, estimated low search cost. And the fact that the average exit rate is so low, both before and after expiration relative to pre-pandemic times is pinned down by the fact that we estimate that it's much more costly for households to search for jobs during this time period. Kurt, I have like four minutes, correct? You have six because you know we started a few minutes late, so you've got six minutes. Even better, all right, thank you. Okay, so in this enriched model, we use this enriched model to um, quantify the impact of the $600 supplement uh, on job search. And so what I'm plotting you uh, here in purple is the same sort of model line that I was showing you before. And in green is what you would have expected from the model in a world we didn't have the $600 supplement. And the conclusion that you get is that there's very, very minimal impact of this even very generous supplement on UI exit. You know, why is this happening in the context of the model where the fact that so many households are returning, are being recalled to their prior employers, and because the cost of job search is estimated to be so high, that means that the incentives are uh, muted for households. And so they don't respond even to massive changes in replacement rates. In order to compare our estimates to the prior literature, we compute the standard statistic in the prior literature, which is the um, elasticity of unemployment insurance duration with respect to benefit levels. And what we, can, what we find is an elasticity of 0 0.02. So on this plot, I'm plotting our elasticity here in the dark blue circle. And I'm putting the elasticities from prior literature from this recent survey from Schmida and Von Wachter in these gray circles. And what we see is that our elasticity is smaller than every prior estimate of this duration elasticity and is orders of magnitude smaller than the mean and the median of the prior estimates. So we're finding a very, very uh, different effect of increased benefit levels on job search in the pandemic than you would have expected based on pre-pandemic evidence. So to summarize, where we are on job search. What we find empirically is that job finding is falling from May to July. It remains low even after the benefit supplements expire, which sort of just suggests that those supplements weren't themselves holding back uh, job search. Indeed, we also find that half of reemployment occurs while households are still eligible for the $600 supplements. Again, suggesting that households were still willing to go back to work even when they were eligible for these very large supplements. Both these patterns contrast sharply with the simple model um, that matches pre-pandemic evidence, which would predict that job finding would go nearly to zero when this generous supplement was available. In contrast, when we use our rich enriched model that where we add the recalls and where we, uh, where we estimate the job search costs during the pandemic, we can closely match the data that we see and it implies a very small distortion. The elasticity of 0.02 suggests that the $600 supplement decreased employment 
only by 0.2 to 0.4% during the summer of 2020. So we can then compare our spending estimates to our job search estimates. So just looking in partial equilibrium, we estimate that the $600 supplement increased average uh, aggregate spending by 2 to 2.6%. If you just look at the search disincentive of the $600 supplement, as I just mentioned, we estimate that that, that decreased employment by 0 0.2 to 0.4%. However, if you want to look at the total impact on employment, you want to try to understand, well, what did this increased spending, what in fact would that have had on employment? And so the question we ask is, how many jobs needed to be created by the extra spending in order for um, employment to break even? And what we find is that the supplements increased employment if the cost per job is anything below about $450,000. This is much higher than the actual estimates of cost per jobs uh, that were estimated in the Great Recession with an average estimate of about $50,000. So under these types of estimates of how much spending translate into new jobs, you would, have, you would conclude that the expanded UI um, not only increased spending, but actually increased total employment on net. So to conclude, what we saw was a massive increase in transfers, largest expansion of unemployment insurance benefits in, in history. These were large enough quantitatively to drive aggregate patterns and spending and savings. So far, what we found of the, of the data up to this point, it appears that this sort of relatively novel uh, lever of countercyclical unemployment benefit levels appears to be pretty promising. Spending responds sharply to benefits at the onset of benefits, at the expiration of the supplement and at the payment of the additional temporary $300 supplement. This finding of a very sharp spending response, especially to the $300 supplement contrasts sharply with predictions from standard models that would expect that their spending response would be muted by this point when households have accumulated a substantial amount of liquidity. In contrast, the job finding response is itself very muted. We find that job finding changes very little despite dramatic swings in unemployment insurance replacement rates during this time period. However, one thing we want to note is that we might expect that this pattern uh, might not continue indefinitely. You might expect that distortions may increase as the economy recovers, as more employers are searching for jobs, and um, as it becomes easier potentially to find a job. Now, I know that uh, what you're all probably wondering by this point is what happened to that uh, Kentucky coffee shop, Moonbow. So we did a little bit of Googling and it turns out that they did not reopen when the $600 benefit expired at the end of July, which suggests that this benefit was not the reason that uh, was preventing them from operating. However, the story does have a happy ending. The good news is that they did end up uh, reopening in October. All right, thanks a lot. Okay, well, perfect timing. Uh, Pascal, thank you very much. Uh, so now everyone who's out there, we're going to open up the floor to the live Q&A. Uh, so if you have a question, uh, feel free to, to raise your hand uh, and then I can unmute you and, and call on you. I mean, I'll, I'll start off with a question that, you know, this was something you know, that my co-author Stan Rabinich and I, would, we were kind of thinking about this, you know, uh, the, you know, how much the disincentive of UI is in this setup is going to depend a lot on what you expect your job prospects to be are in the future, right? Like in the model we wrote down, you know, if you think that the labor market is going to be really bad, you know, in the fall of 2020, you're willing to take a job even if you're losing income relative to UI, right? It's like, because, you know, it's not that you know that you can go out with probability one and find a job once the UI stops, that you, you know, you kind of don't get that going to zero if you think that things are bad. Similarly, you know, like Simon Mangi uh, and, and uh, you know, Karina Moore looked at like, you know, you're like turning down, going back to a job. So do you have a sense of, you know, I, I was kind of, I'm rambling a little bit, but one is like, there's to compare to the previous literature, there's like this whole issue of, you know, what did people know or expect about COVID? And I was wondering in your data, can you look at actually people who kind of were recalled? So who go back to the same employer that they had before? Because at least, I mean, maybe they didn't know that they would go back, but I mean, that would be at least interesting to look at the subset of people who actually did because they 
presumably had some thought at least that they were going to go back or that there was the chance that they could go back to where they were before and see if the spending patterns are kind of different for people that have potentially, you know, were knew they were on temporary layoff and had a chance to come back versus didn't. Uh, so we're, we're, this is like, we literally have new output on this in the last 24 hours, which is why I'm laughing. Um, but we're, we're actively looking at this issue. And I think it's interesting exactly for the reasons that you raise. Um, we don't observe expectations. We do observe individual recalls. The one other thing, which I think is potentially powerful that we haven't, didn't really use in the talk, but we're working with is we observe for, uh, a measure of firm. And so we can do firm level recall rates. And you can think about the individual dynamically updating her expectations on the basis of firm recall. So I'm like super fired up about this, but I don't have any answers. No, it's cool. It's, I mean, obviously, yeah, it will be really interesting. I will in the future, yeah. maybe. Oh, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, it's, but I think expectations are crucial. You know, we never, they're always tricky to observe. And in particular, like, this is what, uh, we're interested in going as far as we can, push the data as far as we can in this direction, precisely because it's central. You know, it, it would be, I mean, I guess for me, it would be interesting if like in, in your, kind of while you write down, like you kind of, you kind of would, you know, do like a pessimistic versus an optimistic expectation of what people thought the fall would be to see how that would change their, their behavior. Because I think, you know, my guess is that you could probably get some, some action if people think that the fall is gonna be really bad, they're gonna behave differently than if they think that you know, it's going to be a V-shaped, you know, we're back in, in a few months kind of recession. So. Yes. So basically it's the, the thing we would move is future expectations of the future job finding rate or the future search efficiency, and then redo the experiment under different scenarios. And then think, ideally use the data to teach us something about what people actually believe. No, yeah. At least to see, I mean, how much, how much that matters. I mean. Great. Okay. That's really cool. People are being shy. Don't be shy. You should ask questions. Peter and Pascal are great, and Joe. Um, I'll, I'll ask something because I think it may have come up in the Q and A, but I I wasn't reading that in the meantime. But I was wondering just what you know about the the stimulus checks that were coming out at the same time. Um, so like, are the, these UI guys are are also getting that presumably, and what's the timing of that relative to the UI checks and that kind of thing. Great. So um, I'll give a, a, a brief answer and then feel free to sort of follow up with more detail because there's different like directions it could go in. So um, UI checks are for most people going out in April. For people in the sample, they average about $1,800. The average is similar, sorry, for the UI, you know, the UI recipients. The control group is matched on the date of receipt of the UI check. You mean EIP? Sorry, the control group is matched on the date of the receipt of the EIP check. And so the idea is that we're trying to isolate the impact of UI by taking employed people who are getting similar EIPs, at sort of similar in amount and similar in timing. That doesn't mean that it doesn't affect, you know, there's an income effect from EIPs and so it can affect the choice environment, but we're from like the program evaluation perspective, we're trying to difference that out. So for example, like the people who are waiting for UI benefits until June because they encountered hor horrible delays, are also getting EIPs just like the people in the treatment group, for example, and like that first research design. Feel free to ask more if. Uh... Anyone from uh, well, the floor? Well, we're waiting for other oh. questions. I just had another random question about the data. Um, I know you said you looked at how your, your data set compares to like other aggregates in terms of UI receipts and stuff like that. Um, have you checked what it looks like in terms of job monthly job finding rates and like let's say duration dependence and job finding rates and stuff like that great so i'm just taking notes so uh monthly ui exit rates tend to be around like 30 percent a month in the administrative data and that's similar pre-pandemic it's the ui data go kind of wacky during the pandemic and so you get really huge jumps during the pandemic such that it's hard to calculate UI exit rates in the administrative data. Like we've tried, but just estimates are noisy. Um, in terms of duration dependence, uh, we have looked at that a little bit in prior work, but I don't, I don't have the best answer. So let me, let me try to, let me get back, do more looking to before giving a precise answer about that. 
There's one other question from the Q&A that I just want to elevate because I thought it was a really nice, like, helpful big picture question from Claire. And I apologize, Claire, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, which was basically, in what ways do you think the results from this moment will or won't generalize to other time periods? And uh, sometimes I, I feel like the, the best answer is for each specific moment to think about what are the forces affecting that moment. So for example, for spending, like we think that the dominant force in this moment is being shutdowns relative to a normal time. And so we conjecture that the spending responses we estimate for, to UI benefits are gonna be a lower bound in the spending responses to UI benefits in other times. You could potentially undo that with something else very different in the environment, but we sort of think of that as the most important force. On the job search side, we're much, we're still working through what we think are the important forces. And so, and you know, Kurt named one of them, for example, about essentially expectations of future efficiency. And so we're um, trying to work through what are the forces that one would want to have in mind when thinking about how to extrapolate. And I think it's less clear cut than the, uh, than the, it's less clear cut than spending, or I think it's relatively clear what the key forces are. I'll, I'll just jump in and ask the question. So I had in mind a little bit what uh, Kurt was talking about too with the uh, recall, because that, that may also explain the consumption response, no? Um, so basically if you're getting this transfer, but you're expecting to go back to the same job. Um, the, the other thing I was thinking is, um, and do you have also, can you also see what people spend on? Because it might, of course, be spending on something that's complement with Nisha. Um, so we are, we've previously had access to what people spend on. Unfortunately, that pipe broke right around the time the pandemic started, and we're still in the process of repairing it. So we don't have estimates of, of types of spending yet. Um, in terms of the question of how does an expectation of recall change the spending behavior? You know, my, my you know, if I guess in the limit, let's suppose that you get UI for just one day and then you get reemployed. At that point, I think basically you should think of the consumption effects of UI as being consumption effects similar to an untargeted check, right? Because there's less and less of a perturbation of your income process in general or your expectations. And so then just sort of, you know, I think you can, um, I think that that force tends to drive down the spent, we're trying to drive down the spending response. You know, an unemployed household has temporarily low income, and so they're going to want to spend more of their UI check uh, to sort of solve a liquidity problem. Um, so I don't, we're going to we're hoping to work yeah, through this. I, mean, in it, I, I was thinking instead, like, um, so if the if you're drawing up unemployment benefits, but but you expect to go back to the same job, then it's not a very persistent income loss you're faced with. And so then you sort of, you know, a PIH agent or an agent not at a liquidity constraint getting a one-time transfer is sort of how yeah. I would think about it. Yeah. So we're, we're actively working on the empirics of exactly doing the test that you suggest. So we think, it, we yeah. think it's, so hopefully we'll have answers soon. That's great okay. paper. Well, we are out of time. Uh, we went a little bit over since we had the technical difficulties with YouTube at the beginning. Uh, but I want to say thanks a lot to everyone uh, who were attendees uh, and to David, uh, Peter, and Pascal for uh, their presentations. Uh, if you would like, we will continue the discussion uh, in an informal setting. Uh, the link to that meeting is in the chat. Uh, or just right after I said informal discussion. So. Thank you for now. I'm going to stop the recording. I'll keep the this webinar open for a few more minutes to give you a chance because once I close it, the link will disappear. So click on the link now if you would like to join the informal discussion and I will see those of you there. If not, uh, we will see the rest of you uh, for Andre Ghent next week on VMAX. And remember in the US, we still in Europe are one hour closer next week. So uh, then after that, we go back to the, the normal time. Thanks a lot.